This tutorial will teach you the basic progressive web app concepts by turning an existing web app into a PWA using only the native browser API. Before I go any further, I need to warn you that the procedure as outlined in this video will not work for Node.js single page apps. It will, however, work for Node.js based on a layout page and for other single page and multiple page apps. We start with the site that I created in the series called Wappler for new users. This is so that I have an existing site to work on. In your case you will most likely use an existing site of your own. Open the site in a browser. I am using Google Chrome in order to use Lighthouse. But the latest version of Microsoft Edge will give the same option. However, Lighthouse is called Audit when using Edge. Either, right-click on the page or press F12. This gives us access to the developer panel where we go to Lighthouse. We are interested only in the PWA, hence tick that option. Generate the report. Here we see three headings. For the moment, we will only view the items under the installable heading. Here we see that there is no registered service worker and no manifest. To make a progressive web app, we need to develop a responsive website, which we have done. After that, we need only two things, a manifest and a service worker. The web app manifest is a simple JSON file that tells the browser about your web application and how it should behave when added on the user's mobile device or desktop. To create the web manifest, I go to the Dunplab website. This site contains heaps of resources for web developers. I scroll down and choose the section that we are interested in. This page has a detailed explanation of a web manifest. It also contains a web manifest generator. So let's use that for our site. I enter the information that pertains to my site. I also upload the image that I want to use for my site. Note that the image must be 512 by 512 pixels to be of use. When I scroll down, I come across the deployment instructions. We need to create a manifest file and link to the file in the pages. I copy the contents for the manifest file. I also download the file containing the icons. Back in Wappler, I go to the Files tab. In the Site Root folder, which in this case is the public folder, I create a new file and name it manifest.json. I open the file and paste the copy contents into it. Before I forget, there is a small error. The value for prefer related applications has to be a Boolean value. At the moment this is a string. Removing the quotation marks will do the trick. The source for the images also need to be modified depending on where the icons are placed. I'll first add the icons to the assets folder. Copy the icons folder from the downloaded zip file. Navigate to the project folder and open the assets folder. Paste the copied icons folder inside the assets folder. When I view the contents of the icons folder, I see the images that were created by Dunplab. While we are here, copy the link that has to be placed in the page. In Wappler, open the index page in code view. Paste the link in the head section of the page. Because we have given the manifest a different name, I need to adjust the link. Don't forget to save the changes. I can now adjust the link to the images in the manifest. To do this, we use multi-cursors. Click inside the first link. Then hold down the Alt key and click in the same spot for each of the following links. Here we see multi-cursors in action.
Once I place the last cursor I add the correct path to the link. Don't forget to save the file. To see the effect of our work so far, open the page in the browser. Go to the Application tab and choose Manifest. Here we see a warning that there is no registered service worker. That will be our next task. For now, we can see the contents of the manifest that we have just created. When I choose service workers, we see that none have been registered. So, by now we know that we need to create a service worker. The web app manifest that we have just created, identifies our website as an app to the browser. The service worker is a JavaScript worker that sits between your application and the network. With it, and some supporting APIs like Cache API, we're able to have full control over how our application behaves in any network situation. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's create an empty service worker and register it. In the root of the application, I create a file named sw.js. I will leave this empty for now. To register our service worker so that our browser can install it, I create another file named app.js. Open the file. Copy the code that I have listed below for app.js and paste it into the file. To explain, if the browser supports a service worker then register the service worker and create a console log that it has been registered. If the browser does not support a service worker, then create a console log that shows an error message. We must now link this file to the page. Open the index file in code view. I place the link at the bottom of the document. I type, script and press the tab key. Then I enter the link. When we now view the page in the browser, we see that the empty service worker has been registered. The time has come to populate the service worker. Copy the code below for sw.js, open the server worker file and paste the code into it. The service worker is essentially a JavaScript file that runs separately from the main browser thread. It is totally event-driven, meaning that an event has to take place for the service worker to respond. At this stage, I will not explain in detail how the code works, I will leave that to a video called Service Worker Explained. For now I will give a brief description of what happens. After registration, which we activated at app.js, the browser emits an install event while the service worker is being installed. We make use of this event to cache all of the shell components inside of the static cache. The install event emits an activate event. We use this event to delete caches that are no longer being used. This may sound complicated, but it is a very important part of housekeeping. I'll detail this in Service Worker Explained. The fetch event is emitted when the browser makes a fetch request. As an example, this happens when the user opens another page. We use the fetch event to get cached assets if they exist. If the browser is online and the cache does not exist, then the resource will be placed in the dynamic cache. If the cache does not exist and the browser is offline, then it will load a fallback page. At the top of the document, I have declared a number of constants. Yes, I know that the editor does not like the abbreviation of the word, constant. But it is perfectly legal to use. The first constant carries the value of the static cache name, while the second constant carries the name of the dynamic cache. The version will be explained in the other video. Then there are the assets. These are the resources that will be preloaded into the static cache during the install event. I will return to this part too. Lastly, there is the function that limits the number of entries in the dynamic cache. This function is used in the fetch event. Don't forget to save the file. Scrolling back to the bottom of the page, we see the reference to a fallback file. As mentioned, this file will show when there are no required resources in either the static cache or in the dynamic cache. Here we will create a new file in the root of the application. We name this file fallback.html. Open the file and place appropriate content into it. Here is a page that I prepared earlier. Let's now have a look at the page in the browser. If you have not refreshed or restarted the browser from the last time, you will see the service worker that we registered with an empty service worker file. 
when I reload the file, a second, service worker appears. This is because the service worker was modified when I added the contents. The second service worker will be activated when the browser is restarted. This is so that, when a user is browsing the site, they will not suddenly be confronted with a different environment. Let's now go to Lighthouse and generate a report. Here we see that we have gained a few more green dots. All that is left is to optimize the PWA. Right. I have gone way past the self-imposed 10-minute video limit. So far, we have created a working PWA. What is left is a bit of tweaking. I will show how to do that in part 2. In the meantime, there are two lines of code that need to be added to the other pages. If you have a template or a single page app, you will be spared from having to do this. My name is Ben Pleasier. I hope to see you for part two.